The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome back, everyone. Week two, topic two. Thanks for tuning in. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Wherever you are, scattered around the world, thanks for tuning into our second discussion tonight. We are, of course, going over topic two, and hopefully some of you have had a chance to have a look at the study guide and perhaps even had a listen to the pre-recorded audio to get a, a gist of what we're going to cover this evening. Uh, but we've moved a little bit higher above the, the uh, extreme theory that we dabbled with last week. Uh, we're going to go into writing, uh, language, and uh, that form of communication. We're still going to be uh, discussing a bit of theory. Each week we'll go through, you'll perhaps and hopefully notice that we move and shift a little bit away and from theory and lift ourselves up week by week into more and more practical concepts. So hopefully we'll maintain that trend. Uh, now, we've just got uh, a few people still rushing to log in as, as we speak now, uh, which is great. Uh, we've got the poll up there for everyone who's had a chance to have a look at that. I'm going to close the poll and uh, share that with you just uh, for interest's sake. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have got uh, curiosity about that. Let's share the results of that. For everyone to see. So there we go. Uh, a bulge. In the middle to low end, uh, great to see that you know the vast majority of people have thought about it at some point. It's it's obviously uh, I mean what I'm going to presume from that is that there's been things in there that we've covered last week that have given you something to think about, and perhaps you've encountered some examples of some of those things that we talked about, some of those things at play, some of those things happening and and uh, relevant to what you've been. Maybe some of it has shaped or reshaped the way you've gone about it. Uh, a few people have suggested that it's happened fairly frequently. Uh, interesting to see that a few people have found that it hasn't happened and uh, I guess perhaps uh, we might assume that some of those haven't had as many uh, communication interactions available to them in that week or, or perhaps uh, nothing came up that sort of resonated. Uh, but uh, I'm great to see you all back. Uh, hopefully it doesn't mean that you didn't get anything out of last week, it just means that it didn't become relevant for you. So at least that's the assumption I'm going to go with. Uh, so. Tonight, uh, before we kick off, I am just going to revisit some of the practical stuff that uh, you need to think about. Uh, for those who might have missed last week or come in a little bit late, just very briefly for a couple of minutes. Uh, first of all, the, the housekeeping. Let me just close and hide the poll, and uh, we'll kick off the presentation side of the discussion. Now, remember the questions box. That's the place where you throw in your comments, your questions. We're going to do it a, a little bit more in the way of comment this week. I want to encourage everyone to give comments, uh, express your views, your thoughts, your ideas, uh, anything that you want to add. I want to try and pull them into the discussion as we go, so feel free to do that. Uh, we've got uh, James with us again at this end who's helping us keep those comments sorted. So. He'll be trying to uh, grab those thoughts and flag them so that we can bring them into the comment uh, in the conversation. I have to apologize in advance if we don't manage to pull all your comments in. Uh, we might sometimes get uh, quite a bit of interactive discussion, but we want to do that. So it's not just questions. Uh, if you have a view, we'd love you to share it, and we'll share it with everybody else. So housekeeping, the, the simple things, questions box, we covered that. Uh, please use it. Please throw things in there. Uh, we'll we'll uh, do that as best we can. Uh, the portal, the online portal, hopefully most of you have had a chance to have a good look through that. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please do so. It's where you'll find all the information that you need. Make sure that you've got access to that. Uh, do tune into the discussion forums. There has been some interesting discussions and uh, there's been some diverse contributions from that, which is fantastic. Great to see that sort of stuff. Uh, I've thrown my own two cents worth in on a couple of them. Uh, hopefully that's been useful. And uh, you know, bear in mind that you know when I throw my own thoughts in, I don't want to close off a discussion. I'm, I'm hoping that everyone can continue to debate and uh, discuss whatever thoughts are being put out there. Uh, we might put some other questions up in the forums at the end of this webinar or after this webinar to provide a bit more thought-provoking things to think about. And of course, all these webinars are recorded. You'll find them uh, up in the the portal, so you'll be able to download that in various formats. There's also YouTube versions for anyone who needs to get it in a streamed format. Uh, there's the address for those of you who, I mean, surely you've, you've all had some opportunity to have a, a crack at that in the meantime. So, uh, If you have any technical questions, admin questions, can't do this, how do I access this, how do I find that, uh, hopefully James will be able to answer a lot of those directly uh, by text in the questions box for you as we go through the discussion tonight. So remember the basic information. 
people, subject mentor, admin team, Charles Sturt University, three different layers. Uh, some of you have already got involved in some of those. We've had some communications from some of you. That's great. Uh, if you don't know who or what to do, uh, put it in the forums. Someone will give you an answer to that. Uh, the interaction, of course, the learning portal is where it all stems from. That's where the forums are. Uh, that's where the, the webinars are recorded. Uh, and of course, you can email us if you need to, if you've got any specific questions. Uh, there is an assessment. Uh, it's in week five. Uh, for those of you who aren't sure, there is going to be a on, an online test uh, in week five. And if you complete it and pass it during the uh, that, that one week accreditation period, you will earn a certificate. But only if you do so during that week. And what does it include? Well, anything that we might put up there for you to read, uh, and next week there will be. Uh, there'll be a prescribed reading. There'll be a, a short PDF there for you to read and look at. The pre-recorded audio and, of course, the webinars. So that's the basic information. Uh, hopefully you've all got your head around all that. Without further ado, let's get into our the more interesting part of the discussion that we're talking about tonight. So we're going to talk a little bit about language and writing. Now, why have we separated this out? What's the point? Well, we talked a fair bit about some of the higher thoughts on communication in general last week. And what we tried to cover last week really didn't necessarily put itself into any particular medium or form of communication. You know, some of the things we covered would be equally or possibly appropriate to all forms of communication, whether that be verbal uh, or, or written, etc. But there are some specific things that go on in a written communication and in the reading of a written communication that are worth talking about and worth having a look at. And the first question, similar to how we looked at that last week, was why should we pay attention to this? How, how much does it matter really? How much attention should we put into our writing and what difference can it really make? Well, one of the things that language in particular does for us is that if we are not there in person, if we're not presenting ourselves, then the language that we use and how we use it and what we use becomes our persona. So that becomes the representation of many aspects of who and what we are. The, the less tangible, the more subtle, the more peripheral aspects of who and what we are as the author of some kind of message or communication. So it's more than just the words we use. It's more than just the message that we're trying to get across. It is, in fact, us. And the reason we say that is because the reader, the person who's reading whatever it is we've written, they will make various value judgments about who and what we are based on the way in which we've written something. And of course, what we've said and what we've written naturally. But how we've written it will tell them a great deal or allow them to make assumptions about who and what we are. So we know the rule of assumption. If you don't give accurate, detailed information, people will fill that with an assumption. So they'll make assumptions about who we are. And so the tone of the writing that we, we give, the attitude that we put into the words we choose and the way we structure our sentences, how it represents our character, the implications of what we might or might not know, the, the degree of knowledge that we might have about what we're talking about in particular, and our intentions, what we are trying to achieve with whatever it is we've written. So we've all had those messages that we've written, and even those that might have theoretically been put forward as a neutral document, but you can, you can tell that this author has an agenda of some kind. You know, they have some outcome that they're looking for. They have a particular angle on what they've written and how they've written it, even when perhaps it's something, the subject matter is something that shouldn't have an angle. Perhaps then we notice it a little more. But even when it should, we're judging and interpreting what their intention is from whatever they've written and how they've written it. So if we translate that back to us as an author, part of our goal is to think about our language as a tool to create all those impressions, the right impressions, to help the reader make the kind of judgments about us that we want them to make. But the language we use also has some important elements for the message that we're trying to get across. Because the language can create subconscious barriers. And a lot of the subconscious barriers in the reader are ones that they're not necessarily aware of. So some of the things we talked about last week and are in the pre-recorded audio, we talked about uh, the mental processes of thought and the fact that it's all just electricity running through the brain. And anything which diverts that 
electricity into other areas of the brain is essentially a distraction. But it can be subtle. It can be so minor that the reader, whilst they're cognitively and consciously focusing on trying to understand what we're saying in the, in the written word, part of their mind is wrestling with the fact that that's hard. They're wrestling with the fact that there are barriers that come out of the language that we've chosen, and they're not necessarily aware that that's where the barriers have come from. So from that point of view, vocabulary, good example of a conscious barrier, cognitive barrier, the vocabulary that we use, we might choose a particular kind of vocabulary, we might choose particular words because those words are entirely apt and succinctly appropriate to whatever we're saying. Or we might choose particular vocabulary because we want to sound like we have a big vocabulary and we're trying to show off our vocabulary and how we can use crazy different words that most people don't normally use to mean simple and mundane things that might normally be expressed in other ways. Now, is that a good thing? Well, if part of our purpose is to come across as having a clever and large vocabulary, then perhaps. But any extra effort, any extra effort that the reader has to do to compute our message can be considered a potential barrier. And even something as relatively minor as them having to wrestle with the true meaning of a word that they don't use often, even though they might know the word, it might be in their vocabulary and they might have a clear understanding of what it means. But they've got to access a portion of their brain that isn't frequently accessed to find the meaning of that word. And then they've got to plug that in to the rest of the message, which gives the meaning of that word context. So even something as really tiny as that can create these kinds of subconscious barriers that add up. And then, of course, there's emotional barriers because there's emotional language. We can say things, we can even use emotional words, use words that express an emotion. Or even if we don't express the emotion, if we talk about things that are emotional in nature, we might trigger emotions and emotional response in the reader that is harder for them to understand the true meaning and or align with the purpose of our message. So if we're asking why do we bother, the simple answer is because every single thing counts. Everything matters. Everything's relevant from that point of view. Melissa's well, making a comment about uh, former, former PM, former Prime Minister, um, I think is what I'm assuming the abbreviation PM stands for. Maybe, maybe it means project manager. I don't know, Melissa, you have to elaborate on that for me. But she said the former PM's vocab, um, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Rudd. Okay, so we're, we're, you've got an example there of a public figure, uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, as a, uh, and Melissa's just apologising for um, my inability to understand what she meant with the abbreviation. Good example, Melissa, thanks for, for that. But yes, you look at public figures and you know, Kevin Rudd is a good example of a person whom, if you think about some of the ways in which he described things, I mean, any public figure uh, is going to have their persona partly wrapped up in the vocabulary that they choose to use. And you'll find that people of a certain uh, background, of, of a certain vocation, are going to lean towards certain types of language and that will be detectable, even subconsciously. But there's a really significant concept that sort of underpins what this is all about that we did cover in the pre-recorded, and I want to throw it out there uh, and, and get this point nailed down. And I don't want anyone who's got a, a comment on this to come forward and let us know. But this is the concept of dialogue with a reader. And those of you who have had a chance to have a listen to the pre-recorded uh, will know what I'm talking about here. Any written word is, in fact, a dialogue from the reader's perspective. So we might think of writing something as being you know, a monologue. It's, a, it's an outward pro pro uh, progression or expression of information and message. We write and there it is. It's not a dialogue in the sense that, well, they're not, we're not talking to them, not in the way that uh, a, a verbal conversation would be a dialogue. But it's a dialogue in terms of its influence from a barrier point of view and from its ability to create an aligned understanding. What we mean by that is that Every sentence, every paragraph, every message that we put into writing, the reader is judging it and they are, part of their brain is thinking about what they would have said in reply if they could. Now you could think of this a couple of ways. You could think of this as uh, 
that part of their brain responds as if we were sitting in front of them speaking to them. It's just that they don't actually say what it is that they would have said. But what matters is that the thoughts that, can, that create that response still contribute to their ultimate decision and their ultimate influence of what that document brings to them. So they might be thinking, yeah, I agree with that or I don't agree with this or I didn't know that or that's interesting uh, or what about this? You didn't think of this, but they don't get to say that to you because you're not there. However, the fact that they've raised a doubt about something you've said, that's going to influence how they respond to what you've written. So they're going to read not what you've written. They're going to read what they think you're saying. And every response that they form in their minds is going to be a filter. It's going to be an influence. It's going to color everything that they read subsequently, even in the same document. Uh, Gaith, I think, is uh, just saying that it reminds the previous uh, Crown Prince of Jordan, whose shortest words were 15 letters long, who was famous for doing this kind of speech. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great scenario where, you know, we know people that make a point of notoriety about how they, how they express themselves. But has anyone encountered this point before? Has anyone, uh, has anyone encountered this idea that the written word is actually a dialogue from the reader's point of view? And if you think about it that way, would that, could that, in fact, should that change the way we write something? presuming that what we're writing is with the intention of creating a result. Now, if we're writing a narrative for the purpose of entertainment, then how the reader responds is not material to us. But if it is material to us, if we're writing with the intention of creating an outcome, then each incremental thought in their response process is material to their ultimate decision about what they're going to do in response to what we've written. Now, Eric's just making the point, uh, it's, you know, concentrate on the audience. Well, you know, in a sense, uh, concentrating on the audience, think about your audience, isn't a new idea, but not many people do it when they write. What our writing actually does, what it achieves, is response, reaction, and reply. And when we write, these are the things that we should be keeping in mind because that's the outcome. It's what is the response in the, of the reader? What is their reaction to their understanding? So the response is like the dialogue. What is their cognitive and emotional response? What is a trigger? The reaction is then how does that shape their future thoughts and reply, what are they going to actually do about it? How does it actually matter? Now, Tracy's pointing out that um, some of you and lots of you listening to this are going to be saying, yeah, I, I agree with that. That makes sense. Or some of you are going to say, well, I, no, that doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that, uh, et cetera. And, and some of you are going to be saying, well, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I'm not sure if I agree with it or not. Now, those decisions, those thoughts that are going through your head right now are much the same as if you'd been reading this from something that I'd simply written. And it's not much different than if you and I were sitting here uh, in person and you were saying to me, well, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Well, yeah, that makes sense. How it shapes your future thoughts and what you're gonna, how you're going to respond to what I say next is just the same. Guess just elaborating, saying could always be, uh, you could always be second guessing what a reader would understand us. In, in make you sort of simplify our writing to the lowest common denominator. Could that be a, a, a perhaps a problem? I mean, if you overthink this, if you're too concerned about exactly how they're going to respond, I mean, can that mean perhaps that certainly writing a document becomes an inordinately more complex task than it used to be? Well, maybe. Uh, I, I like to think of the 80-20 rule. Uh, you know, you can make 20% more effort and get 80% more results in many cases, simply by saying, well, the 20% extra effort I'm going to make with my writing is going to be taking this kind of thing into account. I'm going to make 20% more effort and think about these kinds of things. You could well get 80% more outcome. That's the hope. That's the, that's the idea. 
Uh, David saying that uh, he said, I write almost everything conversationally. Not sure if it's a bad thing, uh, but when you read it as it's written, it's like a conversation. Well, I think, David, if you're like David and you do write things conversationally, you're probably going to accentuate this concept. It's going to be more potent for the reader because the reader is going to be in a, a mental space where they're hearing your voice, if they've heard it or they'll, they'll supplement a voice, but they will fall into the mental habit, the mental pattern of a conversational response more likely, more readily, more easily if you write in a conversational tone. It's, if you compare that to what you'd see in a sanitized uh, newsreel where you get a, a public relations statement that's written in very neutral language uh, that doesn't really evoke a conversation at all, you still have a kind of dialogue in a, in a much smaller sense. But you compare those two compared to someone that's writing very conversationally and you can perhaps see that the extent to which we might turn on or turn back that concept. But if you want to use it and you want to leverage it, well then changing the way you write by just thinking more about how they're going to read and how they're going to listen and respond might significantly improve some of the outcomes. So I want to throw up an idea called the inarguable prose. Because I'm going to take a step forward and narrow this down a bit. So if we accept that there's response going on, what do we want to avoid? How, how do we narrow down our strategy of how we might go about writing in a way that achieves results? Well, some things that we might want to take away. If we, if we want an inarguable prose, the, the, the point here is that argument, in terms of achieving outcomes, Argument is usually a source of or linked to the barriers. Now, that's not always to say. A lot of these things are, are generic in nature. Sometimes you want argument. Sometimes the purpose of your written correspondence is to create, to find argument, to identify, to bring it to the surface and bring it out. Sure, that might, might be what you're having. I'm talking about that kind of writing where you're trying to achieve outcomes other than argument. So what does an inarguable prose mean? What does it have? What might it look like if you want to narrow the degree of negative response in this dialogue phenomenon from the reader? Well, first of all, you want to take away some of the emotional distraction. You want to reduce the intensity of feelings that you might be expressing or triggering. Now, there's a point here about feelings. You can state a feeling, and it's different from expressing a feeling. You can use language that expresses something like anger, or you can state in a more neutral phrase that you are, in fact, angry. And you will get a very different response. And the response that you get is specific. And making that specific decision about what kind of reaction do you want will and should change the language that you use. So if you want someone feeling defensive, on the back foot, likely to react, riled up, generating some emotion, you'll express something like anger. If you don't, well, you might state it or you might just leave it out. So inarguable prose is something that it, it, it lacks that emotional context that is a distraction from the emotion that you want. Another attribute, inarguable prose uses a graduated expression to build understanding. What do we mean by that? Well, graduated expression, if you go back to some of the theories of learning, uh, uh, some of the most current and most popular theories of how we learn is based on constructivist learning theory. And constructivist learning theory says that the way the brain, the way the mind learns anything, including what it might learn from reading what you've written, the way we learn is we build new knowledge on top of the existing knowledge. We try as much as we can to associate something new with what we already know. And if you look at how we read a document, we want to do the same thing. So inarguable prose is leading a gradual build-up of understanding. Understand one and then understand the next thing aligned to that and the next thing aligned to that. We're going to elaborate in a little while uh, when we get through under concept, context, content. We're going to go over a little bit more about exactly how we do that shortly. Inarguable prose, not reliant upon opinion. It doesn't rely on opinion, conjecture, or assumption. 
again, we're talking about writing that is meant to create outcomes. It might include some opinion, but it'll perhaps use opinion and conjecture and assumption carefully. Why? Because you run the risk that the reader is going to be inherently misaligned or initially misaligned with your opinion. And if they have a different opinion, whether or not that opinion is material to the purpose of the message might not be the point. The reader might still invest disproportionate amount of response time, of thinking time or thought energy into debating in their head with your opinion. Now, if that's the point of your writing, then it's doing its job. If that's not the point of your writing, then you've created a barrier or you've allowed a barrier to the understanding and the outcomes you are looking for. That being the case, maybe that degree of opinion needs to be worded differently, needs to be taken out entirely. Is it doing its job? Jen's just saying that inarguable prose sounds like how legislation was written, acts and regulations, etc. Uh, yeah, there's an aspect of that. And, you know, when we, if, if it, you know, those of you who've had the joy of reading various legal acts, etc., will know that it's pretty bland language. It's generally fairly clear and succinct, and it's, it's hard to be uncertain as to what they meant. And I guess there's a part of that in all of this. You know, a lot of the time when we do write things, we're not always clear about what we mean, and we don't always check for that. And sometimes that's okay. But knowing and understanding the full extent of how that creates problems and barriers for us is the first step in knowing how to write differently. It doesn't mean we all have to write like we're writing legal documents. It just means that we need to be mindful of where we're doing the opposite of that. So an unarguable prose, it invites the reader to think rather than tells them how to think. Again, it's about how do they respond to each point that you make. So this is why the power of questioning is so much more effective than the power of instruction. This is the point here is about the use and power of questions. You could say, and this is the answer. Or you can say, is this the answer? And you're talking about the same thing. You know, the sky is blue. Is the sky blue? One's a question, one's a statement. Now, if they don't quite know whether or not the sky is blue, or they don't quite trust you, or they're not too sure, which one's going to get a more conducive invitation for them to think? Often, it's the question. So what happens in sometimes if you're stating things that don't need to be stated, and you actually want to invite someone to think about something, but you write it in such a way that it is stated as fact, then you create the opportunity for the reader to, again, debate or test or challenge the validity of whatever it is you're saying. And the moment they do that, they trigger the same mental habits and patterns to challenge and question and be uncertain about lots of other things that you've put in your written document. But when things become mostly contentious or are most likely to be a point of disagreement or a point of uh, possible debate, and you don't want that debate to interfere with the message, you can phrase it a different way simply by using different language. Jacob's just pointing out when he's angry, he reminds himself when he's angry that it's not the person that they're, he's angry at, it's their actions. It's a great example of you know, how applying that filter, like for example, if you're about to write an email to someone about something they've done that's made you angry. And it's a, it's a good example of how you would apply this filter and say, well, I'm not angry at the person. If I write in such a way that gives that person the sense that I'm angry at them rather than angry at what they've done, am I going to get the result that I want? Am I going to get the reaction that I want? Am I going to lead towards the outcome I'm looking for or not? Now, if we're going to get all this done and we're going to do it right when we write our documents. How do we do that? Well, some of us have probably met the occasional genius uh, who can somehow apparently write the perfect document in the first go. You know, there's, there's, there may be a handful of them that we come across in our lives. But for the rest of us mere mortals, we have to do something fairly important, and that is that we have to review. We have to think about it. Now, I want to throw up a poll because I want to ask if anyone's got a view on this. Let me just throw this poll up here.
Yes, this question I'm going to convert into a poll. Here we go. Give us your thoughts on this one. This is about other people. What is your view about other people and how much effort do they tend to put into their own written communication? And I guess the most common would be emails. Um, I'm not really referring to things like SMS chat because I don't really consider that to be a form of written communication in this context. It's defined by the degree of effort or the lack of it in many ways. So it's not really appropriate. I'm talking about things that are really going to convey a message. Uh, so it could be email and, and, uh, and things like that, usually email. So you know, how much effort do people put? Could be reports, could be uh, proposal documents, could be whatever. Uh, and this is obviously going to be different depending on what environment you tend to operate in. There are going to be people, some of you, are going to be in industries such as the legal profession where there's a great deal of attention to detail on getting language and getting writing done correctly because there's a high degree of consequence on when that's not the case. And some of you will have less important factors from that point of view. So I'm just going to wait till we get up to about 70, 80%. What are we at? 74% now. So I'll just see if a couple more people put it. Actually, probably we're at 75, so I can probably close that off in a sec because we've got a fairly polarized, we've got a bulge in the results. So we've got enough to sell the story. I'm going to close the poll. I'll wait for that. And then hopefully this works. Okay. So some effort is the big winner and a decent effort from quite a lot of people. There's 13% that have said, well, you know, very little, very rarely. And I think that in the modern world of effective communications, that number, uh, it's an interesting question. Is that number shrinking or growing? Um, depending on what generation you talk to, that, that's probably going to get a different answer. So if we accept that really less than half, most of you have said that fewer than half the effort, for half the amount of effort goes into this, however you want to describe that, uh, half the people, half the time, half as much as they should or could. The general trend is that it could be more, it perhaps should be more. Now, you could argue, you could say, well, look, you know, the reason we say that is because the reason we say that, you know, only some effort is because that's all that's required, right? Well, how much of that is because we have become so numb to the fact that generally little effort is made, some effort is made, we've become accustomed or accepting of the fact that sometimes it's not, sometimes effort isn't made, things aren't reviewed, and, you know, we're okay with that. We'll just try and figure it out. This comes down to our own personal decision about the standards that we want to maintain in how we are perceived by others. It can be as pragmatic as simply saying to what extent do we want to maintain standards of how our communications achieve outcomes. But there's something that happens when you maintain a particular standard of communication on a consistent basis. When others with whom you communicate come to the understanding, come to the habitual understanding that you fairly consistently say what you mean. What happens when they read what you've written is a couple of things that are fairly important. One is that they will assume that they will be able to find a valid, true and effective meaning in what you've written in order for them to act upon it. That will lead to an increase in them checking with you if they don't get it. If they're not clear, they will more likely come back to you and say, I got your email about that. It, this part didn't make sense. Can you elaborate? There will be a reciprocated intention for effective communications. That only happens when they perceive you as someone who strives consistently, habitually to deliver effective communications. So if you're in the 50 to 75% or more, you have the opportunity of getting a reciprocation effect. People will work harder with you at making your communication successful. They will also be more mindful about what they send you because they know that you will be subconsciously judging the communications that you get from them. Now, this can be very, very subtle, but it will, in fact, change the way that 
they communicate with you. You will get less confusing stuff from other people. But it only works if you are consistent above average. That means more than 50%. Eric's just saying, doesn't always revise his written communications. Um, but when he doesn't, he often regrets it. So, I mean, I'm not discounting the fact that we're all terribly busy. And busy is, is relative. You know, even if some people obviously feel that others aren't. But, you know, we're all busy within what we consider to be busy. So we all have prioritization of where we spend our time. And it doesn't always go on communication. But there is an argument that says that in most cases, in most situations, in most organizations, uh, in most professions, one of the top three things, and often the most important thing, is communications. Because for many, and, and especially professions, the way in which any other skill you have, any other uh, aptitude, any other potential for positive influence that you might have, the way in which you leverage that will be based on the quality of your communications. So you can probably think about people who weren't necessarily highly capable, skilled professional people. But if they communicated well, they got things done. They got results. They got results that highly clever people that didn't communicate very well couldn't get done. So it's not just about having good communications can make up for lacking in other areas. Having communications is, is the lowest common denominator. No matter how capable you are in anything else, it will be tempered by not how much you know about communications, but how much you do. Because the interesting thing about communications is that a lot of what we're talking about in these few weeks, most of it will be stuff you already know, or not know, but stuff that you don't necessarily disagree with. But what you might disagree with is how important it is. So a lot of this sort of stuff, you're going to say, yeah, well, that makes sense, but look, is it really that important? Part of the message that we're covering is to say that it is far more important than most of us probably allow for. Andrew is saying that he took that question thinking about how much effort staff put into checking what they communicate. And Andrew's put a couple of exclamation marks after that. So I'm guessing that that has a certain uh, intense meaning for Andrew, uh, that staff checking what they communicate. I mean, there's checking what you send out and then there's checking what effect it had. All right. Let's talk a bit more about review and revision. I want to talk about some practical tips. So I've just thrown it out there uh, and you've all answered that, yeah, maybe it doesn't happen as often as it could. And I've also challenged you with the, the thought that um, perhaps there's, an, there's a reason, there's an argument for saying that maybe we should all try to lift our game a little bit when it comes to improving the quality of our written communications. Well, how? Um, okay, revision's important, I don't have time to revise, or I barely have time to write it, let alone revise it. Well, there is another argument that says, well, if you don't have time to revise it, perhaps you shouldn't have written it in the first place. If it does more harm than good, perhaps you would regret having written it, or have regretted not putting time in it, just as Eric said a few moments ago. But perhaps that happens infrequently, so that we don't feel a sense of motivation to make any further effort. Because all those other times when it didn't bluntly and blatantly come back to bite us on the nose, that was all okay, right? Well, we don't know. So how do we go about review and revision? What are some of the simple trips? Firstly, and some of this is fairly obvious, the personal context is one of the immediate challenges when it comes to revision. When you write something, your head, your thoughts, is full of the context for which you wrote it. Melissa's example, brilliant, fantastic example earlier, her abbreviation of PM. I had a couple of ways that I could go with that. And yesterday, I delivered a webinar on project management. It's full of PM as an abbreviation, it means project manager. That's my context. That's, that's my worldview. Now, it also, in a, a more social context, does mean prime minister. That was her context. That was where she was applying it. But it's nothing more dangerous than context. It's, 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 we all have one, and we all have different ones. So the degree of effort that we put into checking our context 
is part of the review process. And when the, um, and I've forgotten who it was now, but mentioned earlier that they write conversationally. When you write conversationally, you are more inclined to narrow your context. That is part of the mental trickery of when we write and we speak conversationally. Uh, we tend to not be as formal in the presence of transferring knowledge. Doesn't mean we can't be, just means that we need to be more aware of that. So what else? Uh, assumed knowledge, tacit knowledge. You know, we know that these things are relevant to us. We know that these things are uh, a challenge. We know that when we're writing something that's meant to convey a message that delivers an outcome, we perhaps need to check for assumed knowledge or we have to uh, check for tacit assumptions. But it's, it's part of the challenge of the review process. The fact that people uh, read what they think we meant, we read what we think we meant, and that might both be different than what we actually wrote. I, I've done this many times in my review process. I've gone through and, and read a sentence, and, and I've read the sentence thinking in my head what I meant to write, not actually reading the words on the page. And I discover this because I get someone else to read it for me, and they read it and they say, well, hang on, this doesn't make sense. What are you talking about here? Oh, now that I've actually read word by word, you've seen those things before where uh, the reading phenomenon where if you put the first and last letter in the correct places and all the other letters in, in the word get jumbled up, the brain still reads it. Why? Because it reads the word. It doesn't read letter by letter. Take that up a notch to the sentence. We read and grasp the meaning of the sentence. And if we've written the sentence poorly, we'll still grasp the meaning that we had at the time. And quite often the reader will do the same thing. That They'll see it written poorly, confusing, incorrect, but they'll know what we meant and often they'll just move on. But sometimes they'll need to be sure or they'll want to be sure. Here's a tip. Here's a really significant tip. I want to know if anyone's thought of this or done this before. This is a, a process called the deliberate disconnect. It is a process for fast urgent review. And this is because when we want to get out of our personal context, we need to shift our brains. Remember what we spoke about last week? We talked about the way uh, neural electricity goes through the brain connecting to certain parts of chemically stored data. And if we review what we've just written, all our neural conduits are still firing in pretty much the exact same places. So we want to have a brain dump. We want to disconnect from that. Now, obviously, the best way to do it is to get someone else to read it, some other brain who's obviously thinking about vastly different things. They're going to have a very fresh look at whatever it is we've written and test how we've written it. That's ideal. Not always feasible. The other thing we can do, the next best thing we do, is read and review something after a night's sleep. Because what happens when we, we sleep, we dream, our subconscious comes in and basically washes our conscious brain out. And sometimes we dream about it and sometimes we don't. But it's a, it's a brain dump. It's a big reset. And if interestingly, if, if, if you are in the habit of having a 4 p.m. siesta, and if you are, good for you, which I could, but if you are in the habit of having a 4 p.m. siesta, do all your reviewing at 5 p.m. when you wake up. Because after that, even that microsleep, even a 15-minute nap does astounding things to the rewiring of your brain and the ability to come back and review something afresh. If you can't do it overnight, if you don't have time, and you need to review something and send it in five minutes, what do you do? Uh, well, you would go to your favorite website and read something that's interesting, absorbing, thought-provoking, and vastly different to whatever it is you've just written. So you might go and read uh, you know, celebrity pages. You might go and read some sad story, or, or you might read a happy story. Um, you, know, you might listen to your favorite song, and when you do, you reminisce about that moment in time and place that it tends to take you back to. You spend a few minutes doing something that is intended to radically realign the thought processes in your brain. It only has to be a few minutes if that's all you've got. Now, you could simply work on something else, write a different email for five minutes. You could do that. That's sometimes what, all that we're left with in our busy schedule. It really depends on how important is it for us to get whatever we're writing as good as we can. But it, it's intended to give a purposeful brain shunt and allow our brains to do the reset. 
let's look at some of the comments that are coming in about this sort of stuff. Uh, Gates saying, totally agree. Sometimes get bewildered at how did someone reach a conclusion from a staff-wide email that I would never have reached. Now, different perspective, different context. Email, he says, the email must not have been as clear as I thought or requires assumption that everyone to reach the same time. I mean, this is, you, you tell a story to 10 people and you ask them to tell it back to you, you're going to get 11 different versions. Why? Because they all thought, heard it differently and then somebody changed their mind halfway through the telling. You know, that's, that's human nature. That is, that is how our brains work. And we are trying to accomplish things through written communication in the face of all that. Pretty hard. Tracy's just saying, never send an email in anger. I mean, that's an excellent, excellent point. Now, we will elaborate more specifically on the proclivities of email when we talk about it next week uh, on digital communication. But you know, that's, it's very relevant, uh, Tracy, at that, that point. Uh, John's just commenting, reading a document upside down helps read what you actually wrote rather than what you think you wrote. That's a good point, John. I've, um, it's not something I've done a lot because, uh, well, why haven't I done that? It's a good question. Um, I think that would probably be a good idea to try. You know, it's, it's doing the same thing. It's making the brain work harder in a different way in order to compute the process. Nothing beats getting someone else to read it, though. Nothing beats that. And if you do a lot of writing of important things that you've got to check and you work with other people that do, you, you can form a buddy system. You know, work with people that you just, I mean, even if, even if you know that you have a better standard, a better quality of writing that they do, it doesn't matter. What you want is just a fresh brain. And you know, they say, well, that doesn't make sense. And, that, and, and you, you might not take their advice, but they might point out to you the one golden mistake that you have to fix. A um, couple of questions that we'll, we'll just grab whilst they're there. Uh, Lorraine says, asking, how many times should I review and revise something? Well, brings us to the next point. That's a very good question, Lorraine. How many times should we review and revise something? Uh, has anyone get caught up in the endless review? Anyone had that? It, it happens to me. Uh, why does it happen? And this is key to understanding how do you get out of that problem uh, that Lorraine is talking about. You understand why it happens, and it's an emotional thing. The reason we get caught up in an endless review is because we have a disproportionate perspective on what the consequences will be on something that is not written perfectly. So we, we worry. It's an anxiety-based phenomenon. So what we need to do is, first of all, acknowledge that it's an emotionally-based, anxiety-based phenomenon that causes us to over-review something because we are worried that the consequences of not getting it right are bigger than they probably are. It's the reverse of the other phenomenon where we just send it out without ever reviewing it because we don't care about the consequences. So it's the flip side. The other thing is that once we've delivered that kind of communication often, usually we'll become accustomed to the fact that the world didn't end. You know, we didn't lose our job. Nobody yelled at us. Nobody laughed at us. Uh, and it's all okay. So often we can draw upon that, have a bit of more confidence to not second guess ourselves because that's essentially what we're doing when we review too much. But what also happens is that when we review and review and review, what are we doing in our brain? You think about the neural impulses in our brain? we are locking them deeper and deeper and deeper into the groove. Literally, we're, we're cutting a groove in our thought processes and we're stuck in it. It becomes intellectually harder and harder to review what we've done. The more we review it, the harder it is to review it. So when you get stuck in that, that, that is absolutely the time to turn around and say, look, I've been agonizing over this email I'm trying to send. Can you just look at it for a couple of minutes? And, and Quite often what happens is that someone else will look at it and say, well, it's fine. Makes sense to me. Yeah, you, you, you're trying to say this, this, and this. Yes, I am. Okay, well, that's fine. Well, okay, well, I better send it. So don't let it, don't let it get you caught out. Another question from Jacob saying, is self-reviewing uh, less effective than peer review? Uh, in my view, absolutely. Uh, should someone else attempt to disseminate your community? If it's important to you, yes. And like I said before, even if they're, you know, they're not, viewed by you as being as good a communicator, it still helps. Because you're the one that makes the final decision about what you actually write. A comment, question from Push, what's the best way to respond to a viewer's negative comments? If a reviewer says, oh look, you know, this is a mistake, this is a mistake. What's the best way to respond? Firstly, uh, there is a, an element of etiquette here that you need to keep in mind, and that is that if you ever want them to review any of your stuff again, you need to accept graciously whatever they've had to say. Uh, now, they might, everyone has their reasons for saying stuff. 
some people get on a bit of a power trip and think, oh, this, this person's asked me to review their stuff. They think I'm clever and they're not. So I'm going to tell them, I'm going to teach them, I'm going to educate them on how they should have written this better. And they get on their high horse and they, you know, they, they, they red pen this and they cross this out and they rewrite that and they get carried away with it. And um, obviously if you've been through that process with that person more than once, you'll be aware of that and you'll take that for what it is. That's just their method of responding to your request. What you want out of it is that little bit of whatever that they've given you that makes you think differently. That's the end result. Your goal is to be able to shunt your thoughts a little bit. And someone that comes back with a lot of negative criticism about what you've written can be just as useful in shunting your thoughts around as someone who's come back to you and said, yeah, I like that, it makes sense. Sometimes the negative review is more valuable. Even though you might disregard 90% of it because you believe that they have other reasons for it, there'll be something in there that's made you rethink what you've said. So how should you respond to it? I think graciously, in a word, because it's highly valuable. And you know, sometimes that if you get people that go too far and do too much and are too aggressive in their negativity, you give them a bit of coaching next time. Say, look, I, I, I don't need um, too much revision on this. I just want to test this and this. Put some context around it for them. Put some parameters around exactly what you're expecting from them. That might help. Um, Andrew's making a comment here. Interesting that, that, that we mentioned this. So Richard Branson said on LinkedIn last week, that we all need to stop talking in TLA, three-letter acronyms, in an attempt to impress the audience when, in fact, that you, you lose them. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know how much Sir Richard Branson does talk in three-letter acronyms, um, but uh, the world is full of them. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving to a, an increased, the more we communicate, the more effective our communications tools are, the more we want to abbreviate them, because the more we want to, you know, spend less time doing it in, in some ways, but it doesn't work out that way. There's, there's always more communications than we have time for. Uh, Mark saying that uh, part of the standard review process is to send uh, my technical documentation to whoever I know is the least technically minded person. That's an excellent idea. After a while, I usually get an email with a few questions trying to make sure, trying to make sense of, of what I've written. This is the easiest review process ever. Yeah, I, I, I can see your point. You know, if, uh, it sounds like what Mark's saying is that if you want to test how well someone understands something, give it to someone whom you feel might more likely struggle to understand it. It's the context point of view, right? So I guess if you've got a buddy system and, and you've got someone next to you who does pretty much the same job as you and talks the same, walks the same, you know, eats the same things for lunch, they're probably not going to give you as comprehensive a review and feedback as someone who has a completely different view of the world. Remember what the point of the review is. It's to change your thinking. That's all it's there to do. And if it doesn't do that, it, it might be inadequate. Peter's asking, uh, the, the deliberate disconnect context, is this a similar, uh, a similar strategy to working on projects in 90 minute increments? It is a similar strategy. It's, it's actually slightly different. You, you're talking about capacity for attention span and our ability to focus and concentrate on things in 90 minute increments. So what happens is that we can, our, our subconscious will want to take us in other areas. Part of, there's a number of reasons for this, which I won't really go into now because they're kind of complex. But there are a number of reasons why after 90 odd minutes, our brain starts to want to think about different things. Uh, usually, everything that we're not thinking about is accumulating, I guess you could call it a attention debt. So there's an opportunity cost. We're thinking about A, B isn't, get thought, get, isn't getting thought about, but it is actually our subconscious. Some little portion of our brain is sitting there, hanging on to point B, saying, oh, my turn next. Think about me now. Time to think about me. Come on, think about me. And your ability to focus on A diminishes. You've got to work harder at it. So yeah, it's, and often we're talking about very minor increments uh, in productivity and efficiency of thought, but it does actually apply. So it is similar because we're talking about neuroscience and, and thought protocols and the way the brain works. Um, but what we're talking about, the, the del deliberate disconnect, might take five minutes. I'm not saying go and spend half an hour goofing off in the back room and then come back and review your document. I'm, I'm suggesting that if five minutes is all you've got between when you've written and when you have to review, you want to work as hard as you can to think about something completely different. 
with a completely different meaning and, and re rewire your brain in that time. Eric's saying uh, he only reviews once. Subsequent reviews uh, offer less benefit for the effort expended. Absolutely. Diminishing returns. This is, goes back to the endless review concept. You, it, it's the concept of diminishing returns. The more often you review something, uh, I, I've, one of the things I do as a hobby is I write, uh, I write stories and movie scripts. I've written ha half a dozen movie scripts. Um, no, no movies that you've seen, unfortunately. Uh, but what happens is that you, know, you, you can review and review and review, and you'll read through an entire script and you'll change three lines. And that might be the 35th time you've read through that script looking to review it, and you'll change three lines. And you'll agonize over those three lines. That can happen. Well, you know, when you enjoy it as a hobby, that ain't so bad. Uh, Dave's making a comment before the advent of word processors. Uh, Dave worked in an organization that uses a typing pool. Typing pool supervisor had instituted a rule which said that you could only send a document to the typing pool three times. An initial handwritten draft and two revisions. This focused on getting the document workable rather than getting it perfect. I think that's a great idea. I mean, it's, it's putting limits around the fact that, as Eric just said, you get diminishing returns for everything. I mean, there are risks of an unreviewed document, just as there are risks of overreview. And Dave was just elaborating on what we said a moment ago, negative response or negative feedback is an opportunity to learn. Yeah, it's, it's all about how we take it, right? But it's also about how we give it. And let's flip this around. Let's say someone comes to you and asks you to review something, and, and you do, and it's you look at their stuff and you go, well, that's atrocious. Man, I really, I really should rewrite this completely. And when you go to give them your feedback, the most important thing you've got to say first is, look, I've, I've had a chance to review this. Um, can I give you some feedback about it? Boy, is that a powerful question. What does that do? That basically opens in mind to the fact that you're going to give them something that they should intentionally be constructively listening to. And they're probably not going to like it because it's probably going to be critical. But they're ready for that. People don't generally say, no, I, I don't want any coaching or feedback on that. Thanks very much. Well, hey, why did you give it to me to review then? Of course they want coaching and feedback. You start with a polite thing. Can I give you, can I give you some feedback about it? Yeah, okay. Well, here's, here's what I thought. Nothing about... Here's what you should have done. It's all about you as the reader. That's what they want to know. I, as the reader, had this reaction, and I found this a little bit challenging, and I found this confusing. Moderate words about you. Don't say anything about them, the author. Something to think about if you are in the get the opportunity to review for someone else. Make it valuable to them from that point of view. Dave's saying reviewers should always offer a corrected version of the text that they consider is incorrect. This allows the author to confirm whether the issue is in the expression or the interpretation. The appropriate revision can be applied. I think that's a fairly complete definition of how reviewing could work. And I think in a lot of places where reviewing is sort of part of the professional etiquette, uh, that may well happen. I, I find that there are going to be some situations, though, where that would be hard to implement on a regular basis. You're going to find it challenging for people to spend the time to, to review someone else's document by writing their own version of it, especially if it's a long piece of text. So whilst I think that you know, that's certainly something that should and could apply in some situations, it might be difficult. And the only thing that I'd be concerned about is that if you tried to maintain that as a habit, people would be less inclined to offer their stuff up for a revision uh, or, or accept it because it would just add to the time and the work. And a lot of the times, you, again, the point of revision is to shift the mindset of the author. Uh, it's it's not always to get another example back. So I think that is a, a puristic approach that is the gold plating version of review if you have the time and opportunity for it. But if you do get the opportunity to review, I mean, you you know who, who you mix with, who is around you, who are good good writers and good reviewers. Read their stuff. You know, this is why we read books from good authors because we appreciate their authorship. Uh, get the good people. Get the people whom you believe are good writers and get ask them to occasionally review your stuff. And if you can get them, as Dave suggests, to give you some example uh, return, then that's great. And if they can't, well, then at least get you know, pick their brains. Good writers, really good writers, are not common, but we can all become one. Here's a phrase from Plato uh, that you know, kind of segues in here. It says, he said... Twice and thrice over, as they say, good is it to repeat and review what is good. It's affirmation. It's positive habits. The more we expose our brain to 
the right way of doing it, the more our brain will do it the right way. But, okay, that's okay, well and good, if you're just talking about revising something. There's a bigger issue at stake. If you're trying to actually pres uh, accomplish outcomes, achieve outcomes, there is a journey that you want the reader to go through, which we're going to deconstruct a little bit. Just before we do that, I'm going to tackle this question from Peter saying, is there any relevance in this strategy to the review of computer programming code? Would you apply any of these things to reviewing computer code? Um, I think there's some of the cognitive tricks that we've talked about, some of the things and strategies and tactics that you might use to allow the brain to review efficiently, like the deliberate disconnect and things like that that could well be applicable. Um, but I do suspect that the review and revision of programming code is going to have some, uh, some specific standards or practices that are going to be dependent upon the situation, the, the, the way in which the code is done, the part of the project that it's part of, etc. They're going to be possibly higher uh, goals and standards or, or definitions of what and how things should be done. But if you're asking for what the, the, whether or not any of it would apply, I would think certainly the neuroscience would apply. Absolutely. You know, the way we think about stuff and what's hard about writing good code the first time is exactly the same as what's hard about writing the perfect email the first time. And what's easy about writing it better the next time and reviewing it and improving it is exactly the same. So the mechanics of how the brain tackles it are pretty much the same. But the standards that we reach and the reasons for those might be a little bit different. So what are we talking about journey? It's a journey of transition. The, the reader, when they read what you've written, are going to be slightly, microscopically perhaps, but they're going to be slightly different than who and what they were at the beginning of what they read. And that is a transition. That is a transformation. They change. They change as a result of the three vectors, the, what they've learned, how they feel about it, and how that might influence what they're actually going to do about it. But they will choose their own path through that, in that everything about them, their history, their, their life's journey, is all contributing factors to how they will respond to what they've read. Along the way, they're going to be battling with all sorts of things that are going to make that harder for them. They're going to battle with, as we've talked about before, the barriers that might come from simple things like the language that we've used, barriers that might come from how we've created the message. Distractions that have got nothing to do with us and what we've written. Distractions that are outside of them in the environment that they operate in. They're going to be battling with tangents on their journey. They might be thinking, have you ever done that thing where you're thinking about something, you're reading something, and a little bit of mind traffic will pop into your head and you'll admit, oh, I'm going to think about something else. You'll change, you'll go to a different screen, you'll go to a different application, you'll go to a different website, and you'll follow. You know, websites a lot of websites rely on that human phenomenon. How they rely on that? Well, you might be looking at the news and you're reading a news website and they're trying to pull your attention away with some ad on the corner that's trying to scream at you, click here, you know, you'll enjoy it, it'll be worth it. The brain responds to that. Why? Because as I said before, the conscious mind is struggling to focus on one thing and the subconscious mind is continually focusing on a billion other things at the same time, all of which are competing for the conscious mind's attention all the time. So when someone's reading something, this whole phenomenon, this, this neuroscience is still going on for them. There is an internal battle in their brain where there is simply their ability to concentrate. We don't want to make it any harder. Part of that is there is an inherent desire to quickly and simply get to an understanding of what's being meant. The human condition is that we don't like feeling uncertain, we don't like feeling confused. We want to end that state. Most of us do. We want to end any uncertainty quickly because certainty is control. Control is power, comfort, safety. Uncertainty is risk, it's exposure, it's fear. So translate that down to simply reading a document. What does that mean? It means that we will often be quick to jump to an assumption rather than read the whole paragraph. This is the whole mental paradigm that triggers things like speed reading and skimming. Why? Because we believe we will get an adequate understanding of what's in there 
just by reading enough to then fill the gaps. And we're often, we're often right. It often works that way. So that affirms to us that you know, that's, that's a valid approach. So we have to forgive anyone that does this because that is human nature to want to do that. So if we feel that that might happen, we're going to work within that. That means don't write three paragraphs when three sentences will do. I, I learned this lesson the hard way as a young man with a boss who, I mean, I, I would put all sorts of elaborate uh, paragraphs together and explain something and say, you know, trying to put forward a justification for why something should happen and he'll write back with, okay, or yep, or no, or next week. You know, that was the extent of his replies. And, uh, you know, back then I didn't understand a lot of these concepts. So for me it was a little bit baffling as to, you know, why would I, I put all this effort into it and he, he wouldn't respond to all the effort that I put in. He just responded to the issue. Uh, and I'm now I know that he probably didn't read a vast majority of what I wrote because he just took the meaning that he wanted to out of it. So when we're writing, we need to do a number of things. If we do have a complex issue and we have to put a lot of meaning into what, meaning into what we're writing, we need to make sure that the essence of it is readily available through the process of skimming. What, that, what does that mean? It means that we put the important things at the beginning uh, and we put the important things at the front and end of paragraphs. It means that we don't use unnecessary words, unnecessary points. Other things that affect the reader's journey, anytime they read something, they're investing in it. They're, they're putting effort in. They're making an effort. You know, the reason they're making an effort is because of what they perceive as being consequences are worth the effort. Now, those can be varied and they can be highly complex, but they're only going to read something because they think it's worth their while. And that could mean because somebody told them to. That somebody could be a person like a boss or a manager or a supervisor or someone who has power over consequences on them. Boss told me I should. Well, I could just say no. I could just refuse to read. Well, what would that mean? Well, obviously there's an old, comp long, complex list of things that could go wrong for us if we don't do what the boss says. It could just be that simple. Or usually there's going to be a deeper more fundamental, more personal reason for someone to want to read something. Or they might read it, but whether or not they get anything out of it is going to be based on their own personal reasons. We're trying to sum it up with a statement like this. The purpose of writing is to create a transformation in the mind of the reader, to alter their knowledge, their feelings, and their intention to act in alignment with our goals. It's a long sentence, and it tries to say a lot. But it's trying to break all these things that we've been talking about and bring them down to one simple thing. Writing has a purpose. Writing has a myriad of cause and effects that go on in the execution of that purpose. And if we wanted to achieve its purpose, we need to try and take some of those cause and effect rules into account. Now, remember this from last week? Concept, context, content. A quick rehash, because this is part of the secret source. This is the, the formula, the mental formula that we need to think about if we're trying to create something that's going to do its job. The concept, the laws of cause and effect that are relevant to whatever it is that this message is about. This is the fundamental laws of nature, laws of physics, laws of whatever it is that we're dealing with. The context is the situation, how those broad rules will apply to whatever it is specifically that we're dealing with. Now, concept, a lot of it that is a given because you're going to be communicating with people who have the same conceptual understanding as you do because they're in the same profession, they're in the same company, uh, they, they're, they have a connectedness or a connection to the kinds of topics and things that you're going to be communicating about and that connection is conceptual. So they're already linked in that way. Sometimes they're not, and if they're not, we need to be aware of that. But if they are, we need to make sure we're talking about context. Again, I'll go back to that terrific example that Melissa gave us earlier. Context. She was talking about a political speaker. I was talking about project management, just from an acronym. So context, never assume context. Always confirm context. Why? Well, is it a waste if you're pretty sure that they're in that context? Well, no, it's not a waste because... The moment you confirm context in any kind of written context, I better use a different word for that, 
The moment you confirm context, what you do is you assure the reader that they can no longer uh, they no longer need to devote thought energy, and they can get straight into the content, assuming that they are familiar with that context. And if they're not familiar with it, then it's very helpful because oh, that's the context that we're in here. That's what we're dealing with. All right, so I can realign everything else in my brain, and now I can compute the content. So how many how many things do we write or read on any given day or any given week that seem to give content out of context? We had a comment earlier um, where you know, someone was saying that they're often amazed at how a, a company-wide email can be so widely misinterpreted. Does that mean the email was poorly written or does it mean that everyone's a little bit confused and silly? It just means that the message that was sent did not take into account the potentially degree of variation in interpretation that could come from that kind of message. If our job is to achieve a result via the communication, well, maybe we should do that differently. Maybe we should think about that. Do people generally think about that? Well, you answered that yourselves already. Less than half the time they do. So it comes down to a message. The message is the reason that we're here. It's the reason we're writing. The message is a summary of everything around the purpose, the intention, the outcome, uh, the, the language. Everything combined all wraps up into becoming the message. So we call it sort of the body, the soul, and the movement. It's the body of the, the, body of the, the writing because the message is the actual words and text within it. It's the soul because it is the meaning, it is the alignment of understanding that we're looking for. We want them to get our message, not the words we've written. We want them to get the meaning of our message, the soul of it. And it's the movement because that's what's going to shape what happens next. Whatever they get from whatever we've written, whatever they presume our meaning to be, that's what's going to determine what they do next. And that's what's going to determine whether or not our communication was successful or not. That's what's going to determine whether or not it's done its job, whether or not it was worth the time to write it in the first place, or whether or not it's actually done more harm than good. Can we think about all those times where we've spent a little bit of time on an email or on a communication, and then later we've had to spend an inordinately larger amount of time fixing the miscommunication, the confusion, the uncertainty that maybe we could have done a little bit of in the first place? That's still far better than all those occasions where we don't know how much confusion we cause because nobody told us. And there's usually more of that than we're aware of. The message is the only thing that has a license to function. What we mean by that is that when someone reads anything, they embrace the potential that they will be changed as a result of their, their reading. It is a tacit assumption on their part that when they read something, it will be something that will reshape them. It'll change what they know, it might change how they feel, and it might change what they do. So they empower the message by the act of reading. They give it license to function to influence them. So the, the message is the only thing that has the power and the right to do anything, which means it better be good enough to do that job. The message should always flow from the larger, broader, down to the more specific from big to small. This is just an echo of what we just talked about. Concept, context, content. We get increasing levels of specificity, increasing levels of detail. That is the direction we should go. Ne never go the other way. We never, we never go the other way and say, you know, at 9 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, we're going to go to the football game. Your brain's just trying to figure out what on earth is going on at 9 to, to tomorrow. Did anyone, did I just say 9.15 in the afternoon? Was that a deliberate form of, of, of miscommunication? Who has, who has afternoon in, associated with 9.15? What on earth are we talking about? We're talking about a football game. That's the context. Go the right direction. Always go the right direction. Part of the trap you fall into when you write what you think. Need to be true to the author? You need to be true to yourself if it's your writing and true to its purpose. Those are the two things that matter. Remember we talked at the very beginning of the discussion, uh, of this discussion, we talked about the fact that the language we use tells the reader a lot about ourselves. 
So the language is our persona when we are not there. It's got to be true to ourselves, our, our, true to our persona, true to who we really are. That's the only way we can maintain consistency in our writing and, and how our writing is reacted. I mentioned earlier, also earlier that if we maintain the same standards consistently, we will create the opportunity for a reciprocal behavior. Only if we are true to ourselves as the author on a consistent basis. And if we're true to our purpose, then our purpose will get things done. But if we get all this right, even just a little bit, then obviously the message can be a powerful instrument of change. And a quote that I like about the message uh, is this one from Mahatma Gandhi, who said, my life is my message. And a very powerful one it was too. Uh, or, you know, still is for, 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 for all of us who, who study all that. My life is my message. Well, that's probably broadening the concept beyond what we're talking about if we're talking about writing emails. My life is not my email. Although for some people it can kind of feel like that. Um, now, comments have slowed down unless my system is... Oh, no, here's one. Here's one from Tracy. Uh, when asking someone to read something... It's like giving a referral to buy something from another business. Part of it is trust. I agree, Tracy. Uh, trust is definitely part of it. And, you know, the biggest part of trust is usually within ourselves. And I could possibly challenge that with another way of saying, well, uh, how much are we really risking? How bad is it really? Yes, it's a trust issue, uh, asking someone to read something that you've, you've written. But, look, if you don't, what are you doing? You're asking the recipient to read what you've just written. You're trusting them. So once you've entrusted them and if they get it wrong or they misinterpret, etc., well, then the damage has been done. But if you trust someone who isn't the intended recipient of the message uh, and you, you, you trust them, you could view that as being an easier trust to make because the damage is repairable before, at that point because anything that comes back from that person can still be acted upon in a way that will correct the message before it goes to the intended recipient. So I agree it's trust. And, you know, we've got to be, we've got to be willing to trust when someone else steps into our thought process and in, into our world. But in most cases, it can only help us. It, it can only help us improve. But that's only if we have the intention to improve, the desire to improve. Jacob's just saying trust shows that you, you value their intelligence. I agree. And, you know, obviously where you have the opportunity to uh, get input from people whom we might consider as being intelligent. And, you know, most of us would work with people that are uh, or have those people around us. And, you know, I, I think that there's a certain uh, degree, even if we trust them to take care of our ego in, their, in how they review our work, we trust them to add to our thought process, even if none of that happens, even if all they are, is a substitute for a disconnect, it's still helpful. So, some practical tips. It's a bit of a recap, I suppose you could say. The last slide. Have a plan for the message before you write it. Number one rule, be clear about why you are writing anything. Be really clear about it. Test it. Be sure. And that can include things like, should I even have this plan? Should such a message ever be sent? So have a plan for the message before you write it. Be clear on the plan. Test the plan. Know the plan. Write what you want them to read. Don't write what you want to say. Don't write what you think you've said. Don't write what you think you mean. Because that isn't what they're going to read. They're going to read what they're going to read. And that's what you need to know. That's what you're reviewing. That is the review process. I've written this, but what is someone going to read when they read it? That's what you're testing, and that's what you want to write for. And, you know, there is a skill in this. There, there is absolutely is a skill that you can get better at simply by practicing this process. You can train your mind and train your thinking to write in a way that will be read better. I've seen many people do it, and it doesn't happen overnight. It usually takes weeks and months to have noticeable change, a noticeable difference, um, but it does change. Keep the ultimate goal and intention of the message, of the communication in your mind. Have you ever reviewed something that's a little bit long-winded and you found that by the end of it, you have actually inadvertently changed your intention of what you're trying to achieve with it? I do that often. 
what do you have to do? Go back and rewrite the first half? Start again? Maybe. Different ways of going about it. Um, in a perfect world, you would have kept a close eye on what your intention was the whole way through. But sometimes our thinking about what we really want to get across formulates in the process of writing. That's normal. That's okay. Some people like to have a good hard think about something before they even touch the keyboard. Other people prefer to spend their thinking time writing. It's, it's not, neither good nor bad. You're simply testing in your own mind how it might be done. Whatever works for you in that regard. Consider how you say it just as much as what you say. What we covered up front. Language is your tone, your attitude, your persona. It's, it's so much about you. Gareth saying the biggest issue that he finds with uh, his business peer reviewing, it takes forever. Communications folks are the gatekeepers to project success. Whoops, I've just lost the, where did it go? There he is. Communications folks are the gatekeepers to project success. How would one help them fast track their process? Peer reviewing seems like red tape within our business. Frustration. Now Gareth is saying, how do you speed up this process? Well, the moment the review of communications becomes formal, it becomes about compliance. That's different. So separate the question of compliance versus the question of quality communication. Now, you might still write a perfect correspondence and it's still got to go through the same time-consuming compliance process that you struggled to short circuit. That is procedural, that is probably of that nature. And I'm sort of leaping to a bit of assumption here of, of what you're really talking about is the problem. But that's how I'm saying, seeing what you're writing here. So how do you help them? Well, one of the ways you could possibly do that is you could put a couple of sentences. If you've got a long document or a long statement or something, put a couple of words or a couple of sentences, want some tiny percentage of, your, of what you've written that stipulates what it is you're trying to write. What's the purpose of this? The purpose of this correspondence is to achieve this in this manner. And then you give them a three-page document. Well, you know, that kind of makes it easier for them. And it's a bit of trickery. But what you're trying to do is you're saying, well, here's what I want you to test in this communication. And if you've confirmed that, well, then we can move forward. You make it easier for them is what I'm saying. The easier it is for them, the quicker it will be in, in general. But I don't think there's any silver bullet for this. You know, there, there could be a number of internal reasons why this is challenging for you. Andrew saying, current marketing people, especially online, say that we need to cap their message short and to the point. In some ways, this turns greater to smaller on its head. Uh, yes, it can. Um, but what you're typically saying, if you're talking about from a marketing point of view, is that you're going to, where possible, target where the concept and context have already been aligned. This is about targeted uh, communications in any form of marketing context. Usually, you'll be doing a great deal of effort in order to establish concept and context in other ways so that the message is short and sharp and to the point. But it also, that, that short, sharp to the point echoes the other comments that we talked about uh, in minimal barriers because you know the hardest thing... Uh, typically you can do is to convince someone to think of something in a way that they haven't or didn't want to. Marketing is uh, one of those very challenging ways in which to influence people. So certainly you want to minimize barriers to that and that's part of why marketing says short, sharp, to the point. Because anything more than that takes thoughts in the wrong direction. Next tip, revise and review but just enough. You know, Try to put a lid on it. Try to, to, to keep it under control. You know, when something's done, it's done. Stick a fork in it, call it done, send it out. Review, but just enough. Only you can judge that, situation by situation. A uh, couple of other comments and questions coming in that we'll tackle because we've still got a few minutes left. Uh, I've got one here from uh, Sobrato saying, working relationships often tends to mask and take precedence over business relationships. Most people want to have a continual work environment. How do we know if people uh, that review our document are keeping this uh, aspect out and giving us honest opinion? Um, 
One thing I would say there is if you're worried about the motivations of the kind of feedback that people give you, keep in mind that the, the, the primary purpose for you in requesting a review is to change your thinking, not to adopt theirs. So the gold that you're looking for is how it makes you think. It's not how it makes them think. Now, certainly what you've written, you're interested in how it makes them think. But you need to then apply your filters to whatever feedback they give you and look to see how it changes what you as the author are thinking about and whether or not that's going to result in a change in what you've written. doesn't mean that you, you, you live in your author's castle and keep everything out and only let through what's really important. Or maybe you do sometimes in some situations. But that's all it is. It's, it's, it's meant to be a stimulus on you as the author. So lots of feedback, you can take it with a grain of salt, you can ignore it, you don't need to take it on board. And if you're in any way concerned of the motivations of the way that feedback comes back to you, it's only feedback. It's, it's not like, okay, you've had your turn, now I'm going to write this for you. So it, perhaps don't need to worry about it as much if you think about it in those terms. Uh, Push is saying, starting off with, sorry for the long sentence, uh, it's, it's no longer than some of the others. What Push is saying is endless review between IT contract, incoming party and outgoing party. Looks like outgoing parties try to bump up the number of review, uh, how to deal with this. They try to make they bump up the, the number of reviews that the document needs. So if IT is saying, look, we need, we need to review this to death, um, sometimes that's the purpose. They, they want the thing to be reviewed to death because, well, sometimes people like to see things reviewed to death because it enforces their degree of power over things. Uh, it, it helps them feel like they're in control and in command of things if they're commanding lots and lots of revisions and know we're going to polish this up a bit more and get this a bit closer, etc. Again, one of the things we, we talked before about that is that if you can create an alignment between the objectives of what's written and what it is written, and if you can narrow down the success criteria, um, one of the ways I saw this done was a list of, of tick boxes, uh, a review process that said, here's the, uh, you know, I think it was six, uh, objectives of the document and just a big square box. Did it, did it meet this objective or not? And you get a cross in that box, uh, then there's something to review. And it really narrowed down what the review process was meant to be. And it really prevented lots of people coming back and wanting to rewrite each paragraph in their own way. Because remember, everything that's written is written for a purpose and any review is meant to help ensure that the document is likely to achieve that purpose. That's what it's all about. If you can simplify that process of joining the dots between intention and outcome, then maybe you can simplify the, uh, the situation and even the power plays where people are just wanting to review for review's sake. And yeah, as, as, as Push says, some, you know, it, it can go on to an extent that it can actually be harmful to the business. So limit the criteria of what the review is there to do is, is, is a summary of my advice. Jen's saying, the problem is, often have the context in our head, but the reader may not have the, the context right when they're reading it. How do we actually introduce the context to the reader? Well, it, I guess that's, that's inherently part of the point. If you're writing for someone who you feel would have the context and your reviewer doesn't have the context, well, A, it could be one of those things where you're saying, well, I'm going to have to take their feedback with a grain of salt because I know they're not going to have the context. Uh, or you, you sort of put that context and say, well, this is an email that's meant to do this. Again, it comes back, what's your criteria? Maybe if you let the reviewer know, if not the context, then at least the objectives, they can give you feedback of whether or not they think it's going to, or how well it's going to do in achieving those objectives. So you contextualize not the story in the message, you contextualize the purpose of the message. Often a lot easier for people to apply a review process from that point of view. That might help. Uh, Jacob's asking a side question. Does meditation help to train focus? Um, well, meditation can help train focus if it's done uh, on a habitual basis. It's less effective to do it as a disconnect process because it normally takes a period of time. It's very effective. Uh, it's akin to sleep in, in terms of it's, a, it's, it's not as good as sleep, but it can be similar. It's far better than, than thinking about something else, but it usually takes time to do. But a habit of meditation uh, will often make that redirection quicker and easier. So the ability to, to think 
rearrange your thoughts more quickly. A, a habit of meditation can help with that. It's a bit like athletics uh, for the brain. So it, it can make the brain a bit more flexible in that regard. Peter's saying, you see how these strategies can be useful in reducing impacts from poor communications, but can someone be effective and productive with these methods or is that open to interpretation? I mean, these methods, um, I wouldn't want to call them a procedure or, or methods. These are concepts for each person to decide how much each of these applies to them, uh, how much they're wanting to invest in any of these. This would be a very hard set of ideas to put forward as a company policy, for example. Can they be effective? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I have seen the way in which these things have become effective in, in majority of cases, in my experience, have been in two different ways. One, in a close mentoring relationship where a strong communicator has mentored someone else's communication skills using these kinds of uh, ideas and concepts on a recurring basis over a period of time. The other way is with reciprocation, where a people, someone has adopted to a high standard the way in which they go about it, and that has very slowly and incrementally rubbed off on others with whom they communicate regularly, and in some cases not at all. So that's a, that's a slow, gradual, that's like using gravity to do the work. But those are the two ways in which I've seen these sort of things done. I've not seen them successful when tried to be done as policy. Uh, Jacob's saying, can you train the, the chemicals and the electrical impulses to be more susceptible to alignment? Uh, yes, you can, uh, because all connections of the brain can potentially be made. And the more you connect with certain areas of the brain, the easier it is for those brain cells to connect again later. So you can also do it the other way. The more widely varied your thought processes go, the easier it is for you to tap into a wide range of subjects. So you get, this is the idea of the generalist to the expert. Someone who is an expert is often someone who spends a great deal of time thinking about specific things and finds it very easy to connect with specific knowledge. But a generalist can pull data literally out of thin air with some invisible antennae that, that where on earth do they think of that? It could be totally unrelated. That's because they have trained their brains through their lifetime to be able to radically rearrange quickly. So absolutely, you can train your brain to do things different ways. doesn't happen quickly. It happens over the space of years because you're talking about significant rearrangement. I mean, not everything happens over years, but if you want to change the way you think, it does take time and practice. And that only comes from an intention to do so. Now, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to look at two more points, uh, two more comments that are made here, and then we'll wrap up for everybody. Uh, first one is from uh, Teresa saying, I find the communication more successfully when I keep my writing concise, when I have time to review and say my message with less words. So absolutely. You know, and if you can see that correlation, the next question is, well, what might prompt you to do it some other way other than that way? You know, if, if you see the no and, and accept that there's a correlation between a certain way of communicating and effective outcomes, why not make it happen? Why not just be that person? all the time. And the last comment uh, from Lily saying, with multi-layer stakeholders and enterprise projects, often the readers provide conflicting feedbacks. Well, this, I think this goes back to what was said before about uh, you know, the company-wide email that so many people determine so many different ways. Sometimes one communication is not enough. Sometimes a single message is inadequate. Sometimes you need to achieve an outcome through a series of communications that individually build upon the complete message overall, that work on uncovering misalignment incrementally and solving that with the next communication. Sometimes the, the objective of any communication is so large and unwieldy that it is a series of communications, each surgically working towards reducing the barriers, creating the alignment, and incrementally working towards the outcome. But if we get just one of them wrong, we can have a big setback or maybe even have to start again. Here's a quote that I like from Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, an essayist and author from uh, early 19th century. He said, use what language you will. You can never say anything but what you are. So all this talk about building better communication habits, 
that's not what you do. That's what you are. If you want to communicate better, you have to become a better communicator. So thanks very much, folks. We're going to wrap up at this point. Greatly appreciate all the fantastic comments and thoughts that have been thrown in along the way. Uh, hopefully, it will generate uh, another round of uh, stimulated conversation on the forums over the coming week. Uh, you will shortly find access to the recording up there, uh, and you'll also find next week's pre-recorded uh, audio files up there very soon. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all your great comments, and for now, good night.